So everyone will continue with our program and let's turn it back to Kim Manager. Thank you, Rick. I'm just gonna share my slides here. All right, so thanks again, everybody for being here today. I'm really excited to be having this conversation with you about stepping into our power in uncertain times. And I'm sure that we would all agree that 2020 has been a year of great unrest, right from the pandemic, which has led to nearly half a million deaths worldwide and still counting, to depression era job losses, to protests against police brutality and systemic racism. It has been an incredibly emotional time. Each one of us has experienced our own personal as well as a collective struggle. And times like these inevitably trigger anxiety, confusion, doubt. As humans, we prefer stability. We prefer predictability. We un interpret uncertainty as a threat, which activates our fight or flight response. As a result, it can be tempting during times like these to retreat and wait for the storm to pass. I've talked to so many people over the last few months who have said, now's not the right time for me to make a change. Now's not the right time to take action. I'm just gonna wait until the dust settles. I don't wanna rock the boat. But as uncomfortable as it feels, instead of hunkering down, moments like these call upon us to step into our power. Every corner of the world is looking for leaders right now, not followers, not bystanders. While many eagerly await direction and comfort from others, those of us as leaders have the opportunity to be that resource to ourselves and to those around us. As we examine the uncertainty at virtually every level of our lives, it reminds us that the world is a living, breathing work in progress. While these are extraordinary times for the sheer scope and scale of the disruption that we're experiencing, we're always living in uncertain times. And we are constantly faced with choices about how we wanna show up. For some, this creates anxiety. For others, those of us as leaders, it offers empowerment. The beauty of uncertainty is that we get to decide how the future is written. We get to choose what role we play in that design. Unless we allow them to, nobody else gets to decide our fate. So some of you might be thinking right now, but I'm not a leader, I'm too early in my career. Or I'm not a leader, I don't manage people. Or I'm not a leader, I'm not senior enough in my organization. Leadership is not a title that is bestowed upon you. Leadership is not a destination that you strive for. Leadership is a gift that is granted to each and every one of us as long as we choose to use it. Now is the time for each of us to think about the leader we wanna be. What role do you wanna play in reshaping the world around us? How do you wanna be seen? And what do you want your legacy to be? As Carolyn said, what do you want your life to look like when you're 80 years old? And so what I wanna do now is I wanna create an opportunity for you to connect with each other and take some time to really reflect on what leadership means to you. So we're gonna divide you up into breakout sessions and I want you to have a conversation about what it means to you. Now make sure that each person on your, in your group has a chance to speak. And I would recommend that you write down some thoughts that come up for you. Uh, just jot down anything that resonates with you that you're hearing or things that you think of that you wanna share, because then you can go back to this later when you leave here and revisit it. So let's take about, let's see. Let's take about 15, 10, 12 minutes, let's say, and divide everybody up into breakout rooms so that you have a chance to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what leadership means to you. 
Great. So welcome back, everybody. And we'll give you a minute. It looks like people are still trickling in from the breakout room. So I'll give it a minute for everyone to rejoin Bye. us. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, all. I can see those numbers going up. So it looks like everybody's coming back. Thank you. And thanks for taking the time to, to have this conversation. I hope that you found it not only to be a valuable conversation about leadership, but also a chance to connect more deeply with some of the other attendees. So I'd love if anybody is open to doing so, I would love for you to just share a few insights in the chat that came up in your conversation about what leadership means to you, either something that you shared or that others shared. Just feel free to put a word or two. People believe in your why, embracing different perspectives, the challenge, the ego, that's great. Be fearless, ask the hard questions. I like that. Empowering others, taking risks, putting yourself out there. Absolutely. Having confidence, courage. This is Carolyn. Hi, Kim. Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> um, so one of the, I thought, interesting things that happened in our breakout room is we started discussing whether women make better leaders than men. Interesting. And, and I think the consensus, and I'd love other people in the room I went to, to, to speak up, but the general consensus, it seemed, was that most people had great leaders who were men and great leaders who were women. But I said that I felt when I looked around the world and looked at political leaders, I've always felt that if we had more women running countries, our world would be in much better shape. Well, look at New Zealand and how the leader of New Zealand did with COVID-19 as one small example. And um, the leader of Germany, when you look at her compared to the leader we have in America, it's, it's amazing the difference between the way they handle things and the fact that she's so dedicated to dealing with climate and the issues that I think are so important to all of us. But I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks. Well, there's enthusiastic support for your position in the chat, Carolyn. <laughs> A lot of people are agreeing with you. And it's interesting. I just read an article on this morning that talked about if we really want to reform police, we should hire more women. And it made yeah. a really compelling argument for the fact that, you know, we're talking about how do we de-escalate? How do we look at the challenges through a non-criminal lens? And it made so much sense to me to send in women who tend to be more empathetic, women who tend to have more, uh, you know, soft skills or the ability to communicate, to handle situations more peacefully. And so, you know, I, I have had some great male leaders in my lifetime as well. And, you know, I think that they certainly have a lot to offer, but balance is really important. Certainly bringing more women into leadership is really, really important. Thank you all for all of your great insights. And, and you know, I really want to emphasize the point about not having to have a title in order to be a leader, that we can all lead from wherever we are, no matter where we are in life, no matter where we are in our organizations, uh, there, is, there is opportunity for all of us. And we're gonna talk now about a three-step framework for stepping into your power. And the framework begins with step one, which is clarity. So as we look out at a world that is thirsty for leadership, right? Stepping into our power might feel daunting. You might be asking yourself, where do I begin? How do I decide where to focus my efforts? I wanna share a few inspiring stories that I've heard recently. A parent is frustrated with the lack of leadership in her daughter's high school. So despite many unsuccessful efforts to create change, 
she decided to band with other parents to create a graduation experience that honored the health and safety needs of the moment, but gave students the opportunity to celebrate and to feel special. Student leaders organized a Black Lives Matter march in a nearly all white town to stand in solidarity with the black community and others who are protesting police brutality. Critics and naysayers spread fear and mis misinformation on social media to try to dampen enthusiasm and keep people home. But the march brought hundreds of peaceful supporters, exceeding all expectations. A woman who had been with her financial services firm for over 20 years decided that now, after many years of feeling unmotivated, seeing her commitment decline, it's time to find an organization that honored her values. Given the weight of this moment and the opportunity that it's brought her for self-reflection, she could no longer stay in a role that made her feel complicit in a system that she didn't believe in. She courageously chose to take a step back and even take a pretty hefty pay cut to work for a company whose culture aligns with what's most important to her. So I'd love to take a moment and ask you to think about those examples and put in the chat what you think some of the themes are there. What comes up for you when you hear those stories? And, and by the way, those are all people in my small little world. These are, these are stories of people that I talk to. So these kinds of stories are happening all over the world right now. These just happen to be a few that are close to my mind right now. Vision, courage, confidence, integrity, strength, perseverance. I love it. I love it. Self-empowered, self-awareness, saw a problem and took action. Absolutely. Determination. Yes. Yes. All of the above. This is great. Um, yeah. I mean, for me, what I think about is these people decided now is the time for change. They're not going to wait. They're not going to wait for someone else to make that decision for them. They're going to take action. And each of these scenarios brought with it its own set of risks, right? It might have been easy for them to walk away and think that that's too scary. It's not the right time. There might be some negative consequences, but they decided that it was more important to honor their values. And so they chose to move ahead. Now we've talked about the fact that essentially the only certainty in life is uncertainty, right? Our goals change, our environments change, our priorities and lifestyles change. But one thing that transcends many of these changes are our values, the core beliefs that define and drive us. And this is what Carolyn was mentioning before too when she talked about principles. Right? We all have core values, but most of us don't take time to clarify them or articulate them. We are so busy responding to the needs of the world around us that we lose sight of what's most important to us. So as you think about stepping into your power, the very first step is to get clear on your values and what you want, not what other people want for you. Look around your workplace, look around your community, look around your broader world and ask yourself, am I where I wanna be right now? Am I living a life that honors my values? How do I wanna show up in the world? What do I wanna be known for? What do I care most about? What change do I wanna see for myself? for others? These are heavy questions and they're difficult to reflect on when you're running 100 miles an hour and thinking about your endless to-do list. But to get the most from this kind of reflection process, you really need to dedicate quiet time. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time. We tend to overestimate how much time we need for these kinds of things. Carve out 15 to 20 minutes every now and then to reflect on one of these questions. And what's even more powerful is that you write your thoughts down. So we have a tendency to think that we're clear about all the thoughts that are swirling around in our head, but the act of translating those thoughts into writing crystallizes them in a very different way. And what's great about writing them down also is that you can revisit them as you continue the exploration process and notice what those themes and patterns are. 
Now, don't be surprised if thinking about these questions brings discomfort. Right? Many of us are afraid to admit to ourselves that what we're doing now isn't what we wanna be doing. And that voice of fear that will inevitably pop up disguises itself in many interesting forms. And that leads us to step two, which is confidence. We talked about the fact that as humans, we prefer stability, even if that stability makes us miserable or keeps us from reaching our full potential. In our primitive brains, right, uncertainty equals danger, right? I mentioned earlier, that activates our fight or flight response. And when that happens, all of our internal resources are reallocated to protect us from harm. But our brains don't distinguish between an actual predator and the threat of something like failure or rejection. When we're in fight or flight mode, we lose access to our cognitive reasoning abilities. It becomes really difficult to think clearly, to process information, to problem solve. And that can keep us locked in our current situations as those internal safety mechanisms fight to keep us safe, right? To keep us from avoiding change. Now, I mentioned earlier that the voice of, disgu of fear disguises itself in many ways. Often, it shows up as the voice of reason. So you might hear yourself say, this is not the right time to take action. The environment's too unpredictable right now. Let's just wait until things settle down a bit and then decide what to do. I'd be a fool to walk away from my security right now. It'd be irresponsible to take risks in this climate. These statements sound like pragmatism, right? They convince us that our desire to create change for ourselves or for others is reckless. It's poorly timed. Just wait, just wait for a better moment. If we listen to that voice, we feel better temporarily, right? It relieves the anxiety that comes with thinking about uncertainty and change. But in the end, we feel disappointed. We feel frustrated. We feel bitter that we didn't do what we knew was the right thing to do. I have had countless conversations with clients, with friends who have, when they finally decide to make a change, have said to me, I can't believe I waited this long. I'm kicking myself for not doing this sooner. I wish I had had the courage to do this when I first realized I wasn't happy. These fears that hold us back, they're not going away. What we need is something to counterbalance the strength of those fears. And that's where our values come in, right? When we understand deeply, who we are and what we stand for, that gives us the confidence to stand up to those fears. It gives us the strength to say, maybe it's not the perfect time, but I will not spend another minute as a victim in my own life. I'm willing to take the risk because even if I fail, I will look back and know that I stay true to my values and my core beliefs. The voice of fear also shows up as the voice of the inner critic. So some of you might be familiar with imposter syndrome. That's a term for the feelings of self-doubt and inadequacy that make us feel like a fraud. Right? Imposter syndrome often strikes during times of transition when we're stepping out of our comfort zone and trying something new. And this voice often shows up like this. How could you possibly think you were qualified to do this? You made a huge mistake. You don't actually have what it takes to do this successfully. Everyone's gonna find out that you have no idea what you're doing. Sound familiar? Right? Just like the voice of pragmatism, the voice of imposter syndrome is designed to keep us from venturing into the land of uncertainty, right? Or as our brains think about it, the danger zone. These voices adapt to make sure that they catch our attention and that they sound as real as possible. Right? Otherwise, we'd just ignore them. In turn, we believe them and we adjust our behavior accordingly. So we might decide to avoid a new opportunity, telling ourselves that we're not ready. We might hold back in a meeting because we don't have the right expertise to contribute. We might stifle our ideas because they're not good enough. The first step to combating these voices and keeping them from holding you back is to recognize them for what they are. 
every time you decide not to take action, every time you decide not to speak up, every time you decide now is not the right time, ask yourself, what's driving that decision? The vast majority of the time when you look carefully and you dig deeply enough, you're gonna notice it's the voice of fear. The voice of fear that's disguised as reason or judgment. And so I wanna take a moment now and break you out into breakout sessions again. And I want you to think about what's standing in your way. What voices are you hearing? What's keeping you from stepping into your power? So let's do another breakout. Mini Wheaties going great. I've got it on another machine and that mine. Jordan is talking. Great. All right, welcome back everybody. I can see all the, the number participant numbers going up. So it looks like we're all coming back from our breakout sessions. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and had an opportunity to share, perhaps vulnerably, about what might be standing in your way. And so once again, I would love for anybody who is open to doing so to just share a few thoughts about what came up in your conversation, what some of the themes were that are standing in the way. Taking risks, yeah. Believing in yourself. Definitely imposter syndrome, yes. And understanding your own journey, culture and language, fear of judgment. Wow, thank you all. Um, I want to encourage the two young women who were in my breakout room to speak up because one of the issues was speaking up because of fear of not saying it perfectly. So here's a great opportunity to actually practice speaking up because you're in such a supportive environment. Mm, that is a great point, Carolyn. Throughout the next couple of days, use this as a practice ground, right? Use yeah. it as an opportunity to build some of those muscles that it might feel too scary to do when you're in your work environment. Yeah, wow, thank you. All of these thoughts keep coming. Um, being in a minority group, caring about the reaction from others, knowing the difference between reasonably cautious and being fearless, you know, not believing I'm an expert. Wow, I could go on and on. I could read those all day. I'm so grateful to all of you for sharing because, you know, really it's not, it's one thing for us to reflect on our own about what might be getting in our way, but it's also really important that we see that it affects virtually everyone around us as well. Right? As you can see from the chat, as you can see from the conversations you just had, you are not alone. Although we tend not to talk about these kinds of things because of shame or fear of being exposed, right? we're all in the same boat. We all experience the same doubts, the same fears. And the more that we normalize this experience that we're all having, the more we can dilute its power. So another step that you can take to manage your fears and to boost your confidence as you're stepping into your power, whatever that might look like for you, is to know your strengths. And this is not something that comes easily to women, largely because of the way that we're socialized as young girls. So many of us are taught that it's not polite to brag, right? Whereas boys bond by one-upping each other. And I read this in a book recently. I think it was that, that's what she said, but I can't recall exactly. But she talks about the difference in the way that boys and girls are socialized. And she says that boys, if you notice young boys playing together, they have a tendency to one-up each other. So you'll see one boy say, look at how great I am at this. And then the next boy will say, oh yeah, you think that's great, look at this. And they compete with each other and that's how they connect where that is not acceptable behavior in girl peer groups, right? We don't tend to look fondly upon girls who think they're better than us, right? We tend to ostracize those girls. So because of those messages, because of those experiences, we have a tendency to downplay our strengths and add to that the natural tendency that we have to focus on what we don't have versus what, what we do have is no wonder that we struggle with a crisis of confidence. Right. And here's my philosophy on this. Knowing our development needs 
Focusing on continue, continuous improvement are noble efforts, right? We don't want to lose that self-awareness. We don't want to lose that desire to grow and improve. But we need to balance that with an unapologetic acceptance of the fact that we already have strengths. You would not be here listening to me today if you didn't. And there is absolutely nothing shameful about that. We have every right to own and embrace our strengths. And when we know our strengths, it allows us to better serve others. We can be more effective leaders when we know what unique value we bring. So as you look around and you seek out opportunities to step into your power, right, look for ways in which you can use your unique strengths. When you're using your strengths, you're going to feel more empowered. You're going to feel more confident. Those feelings are going to help you to bust through that wall of fear that is inevitably going to show up as you take steps forward. So if this isn't something that you've spent a lot of time on, if this is not something that you can articulate very clearly today, here are some questions you can ask yourself to better determine what your strengths are. The first is, what do other people come to you for? So think about this, not just in the context of your workplace, but in your life overall. What are the questions that you tend to get over and over again? If you notice themes, if you notice patterns in the kinds of questions that you get, you're already a leader, right? People already see you as a leader in that area. They're already coming to you for that. So that's strength. Ask yourself, what comes easily to you? What can you do in your sleep? And we tend to dismiss those as not special. Oh yeah, anybody can do that. Because it comes naturally to us. But to somebody else, it doesn't. To somebody else, that might be really hard. So don't take for granted what comes easily to you. That's your unique strength. And then the final question is, what are you most passionate about doing? What gets you excited to get out of bed? Where do you lose time? Maybe you spend two hours on something and you look up and you think, oh my gosh, where did the time go? You may not be an expert in those areas, but the fact that you're so passionate about it, the fact that you have so much enthusiasm shows that there's strength there. So start with these questions and then on a practical basis, I highly recommend that you adopt a practice of keeping track of your strengths and accomplishments. At the end of every day, or at the end of every week, but don't go more than a week, you won't remember, right? Write down all of your accomplishments. Write down what you're celebrating, what you're proud of, the problems that you've solved, the things that you've checked off your to-do list. Be comprehensive, don't filter. And what you're gonna find is, First of all, having that list is going to give you a record to go back to when imposter syndrome creeps in and tells you you have no idea what you're doing, you don't belong in this role. You can go back to that and there's only so much you can chalk up to luck, right? You're going to look at that record and you're going to say, actually, I know more than I think I do. I actually have a lot of great strengths that I bring. The other powerful benefit to this practice is that just like a gratitude journal, that trains your brain to scan the environment for the positive rather than the negative, when you keep an accomplishments journal, you retrain your brain to think about yourself from a position of strength as opposed to weakness. So let's move now to the third step. This is the final step of the framework, and this is connection. So nobody achieves their goals in a vacuum. We all belong to integrated systems of people who influence our paths. Once you get clear about how you want to step into your power, right, the values that you have, the strengths that you want to use, it's important to start engaging people around you who can help you get there. That might be mentors and advocates who can help you navigate your organization to identify some internal leadership opportunities. It might be a network of former colleagues who can help you find a new job externally. It might be leveraging the support of friends and neighbors to drive a new community initiative. Spend some time thinking about who can help you. And most importantly, don't be afraid to ask. This is something that tends to be more difficult for women. 
because like I said, we tend to undervalue ourselves. Most people want to help other people, but we tend to tell ourselves a different story. When you hear that voice that says, nah, I can't reach up to that person because I'll be wasting their time or gosh, what value could I possibly bring to that person? Recognize it as the voice of fear and then reach out anyway. Once again, I cannot even tell you how many people have told me how excited, how surprised they were by the responses that they got when they took that risk and reached out to ask for help. Think about a time when you asked someone to help you and it went well. What did that feel like? Remind yourself of that because we tend to focus on the negative and we forget all of the positive experiences that we've had. Trust me, I get it. I've suffered from anxiety my whole life and my imagination can be a very dark place if I let it. <laughs> but remember, those dark thoughts, they are there to keep you safe. They're there to keep you from taking risks. But in the end, all they do is keep you stuck. Reach out. I guarantee you that you're going to be feeling stronger after you do and that far more often than not, you are going to be pleasantly surprised by the outcome. Now, another reason to connect with others is that no matter how clear and confident you are, you will never be able to do everything yourself. And that's a tough one for many of us as women. We sometimes lose sight of the fact that as leaders, our role is not to know and do everything ourselves. It's to engage with other people who have complementary skills, who have other resources that they can bring and inspire them to partner with us to achieve our goals. Having a powerful network of trusted relationships is far more valuable than any textbook knowledge that you will ever have. And I want to share a personal story about this. So from the time I was old enough to know what this meant, I wanted to be a psychologist. There was no question in my mind. I went to college, overloaded on psych courses, spent the first two years out of college preparing by getting some experience, taking all the standardized tests, getting ready for a PhD program. When the time came though to apply to a PhD program, it wasn't in a place in my life where I could do another full time, you know, five years of full-time study. So I had to make a choice and it was the peak of the dot-com boom. And I had a friend who was hiring at a big tech company and I took advantage of that opportunity and I found myself in a whole new world, a world I never expected to belong to, never had any intention to go into business, never had any, um, never certainly didn't know anything about technology. And I was pleasantly surprised to find that my psychology skills actually helped me tremendously and it allowed me to advance my career pretty quickly. And very soon after I started, I found myself promoted to a position where I was in constant engagement with engineers and other technical people who were having conversations that felt like a foreign language to me. I would sit in meetings and think to myself, oh my gosh, I am one question away from this whole house of cards just crumbling. I was terrified. And so what I decided to do was my, my usual go-to or had been my usual go-to strategy was, I'm just going to go back to school. I'm going to get a master's in software engineering. That'll solve the problem, right? And I'll, I'll be much more confident if I go back and, and learn what all of these people are talking about. <laughs> so I actually took three software engineering courses before I realized, mm, this is not exactly my thing. And so what I did as a follow-on step is I reached out to our executive vice president who oversaw all of engineering. Now he was many, many, many levels above me, but he went to the same university that I did. So I used that as an opening and I reached out and I said, can I sit down with you? I just want to ask you for some advice. And I sat in his office and I said to him, sometimes I feel a little in over my head in these conversations. Do you think I should go back and get an engineering degree? And he looked at me like I had two heads and he said, are you kidding me? If you want to go back to school, go get an MBA. Don't get an engineering degree. You are surrounded by engineers. There are tech people everywhere you turn. If you need to have a technical conversation, bring a technical person into the room with you. You don't have to know everything. You just need to know who knows what you don't and build those relationships. And honestly, you know, 20 years later, 
that is still one of the most liberating conversations I have ever had. And I share it as often as I can because I walked out of that room feeling like a 50 pound weight had been lifted off my shoulders. And I realized, you know what? I wasn't hired for my technical skills. I was hired because of my relationship building skills and the soft skills that I brought to my role. So instead of comparing ourselves to other people and feeling like we never measure up, let's honor our own strengths. Let's decide what we actually want and need to know in order to successfully do our jobs. And then let's strategically leverage the strengths of others who have expertise that we don't have and frankly may never want to have. We are all on teams that are stronger because they're made up of people who are different from us. Each one of us serves a different purpose and plays a different role in the system around us. Don't compare, don't compete, just connect and collaborate. You are gonna get so much farther, so much more confidently when you do so. And so what I'd like to do now is to do one final breakout session. And I want you to talk about what is your next step when you leave here to step into your power? Think about the three-part framework. Is it getting clear on your values? Is it reflecting more deeply on your strengths? Is it reaching out to a new contact? Maybe it's something totally different. There's no wrong answer here. But I really want you to think very intentionally and in a very action-oriented way about what you plan to do when you leave here so that you can step more fully into your power. So Josh, if you wouldn't mind doing one final round of breakout sessions for you know, maybe about eight minutes or so. Okay, we'll do. It was, it was suggested that we shuffle the decks and so I have recreated all the rooms. So don't be surprised when you, when you see new faces, that's what we wanna do. And so I'm gonna open those rooms now. Thank you, I can see the numbers going up. I can see everybody coming back. Welcome back, everybody. I would love once again for anybody who is willing to just share a quick note in the chat about what your next step looks like. Once you say it out loud, you become more accountable to yourself too. So it's helpful to, to publicly state what it is that you're going to do. Being intentional with connecting with others, finding people that complement your strengths, leveraging your network, accomplishment journal, more networking. Great, I love this. Accomplishment tracking. Honoring your strengths, great. Connecting with people. Excellent. Yeah, thank you everybody for, for really reflecting on what a powerful next step might be for you. Learning and honing your skills. Once again, I could stay here all day reading all of these great messages. It's just so great to hear what you're all saying. Uh, you know, I, I really wanna encourage you, over the next couple of days, you're gonna have an opportunity to participate in the sessions that we've talked about, the, the panels, the coaching circles. I'll be leading a couple of coaching circles tomorrow, so I hope to see some of you there. Uh, the networking cafe, other opportunities to connect. So really, as you're going through the next couple of days, be thinking about what you can learn and who you can meet that will help you to step more fully into your power. And when you go back to work, when you go back to life, your community, be intentional about how you show up. Not in spite of the uncertainty, but because of the uncertainty. Always take the empowered path forward. And I really, really appreciate the interaction. I hope you all took one nugget away with you today that you can use when you leave here. And I'd love to encourage you all to stay connected. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime. You can email me, you can connect with me on LinkedIn if you wanna continue this conversation. And I think we have about two or three minutes left. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take any final questions.